call this meeting to order of the Lawmont Housing Authority Advisory Board. Um, Erica, can you do a quick roll call for us? Yes, definitely. So um, board members present, we have Tom DeBee, uh, Jean Christopher, Arlene Zortman, and Lauren Sully. Others present, we have Harold Dominguez, Karen Roney, Molly O'Donnell, Kendra Daniels, Lisa Gallinar, and Sarah Arney. Thank you. Uh, next up on the agenda, number two, approval of the minutes from the January 18th, 2022 meeting. Can we get a motion? The motion to approve. I have a second. All right, so it's a uh, motion by Lauren, Arlene, seconded. Any discussion, any changes on it? Yes. Yes, go ahead, Arlene. So <clears throat> in section 5A under the second bullet point, it's just kind of a question, sort of an understanding thing here. On conversation number two under personal engagement, it says, how can we ensure that all personal interactions are genuine and compassionate? And here we're just saying it's between the LHA staff and residents. And I thought we talked about between resident and resident as well. Am I making sense? I believe so. So that was, what bullet point was that, sorry? The second bullet point. Second one, okay. Yeah. So you'd kind of, you'd like to revise that to have it read LHA staff when interacting with residents as well as resident to resident? Yes, I think so, because I think that's what was one of the concerns was regarding gossiping and everything like that, that the resident to resident interaction needed to be nice. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Ar Arlene, this is Karen, Arlene is correct. So um, the, we can certainly make that clarification um, since it is a, a broader conversation. Thank you. Any other changes? No. Nope. All right, seeing those, so uh, we'll just change that motion slightly to uh, approve the minutes with that uh, change to 5A bullet point two um, to add it, uh, as well as uh, resident to resident. Um, let's vote. Uh, for approval, please raise your hand. Passes unanimously. Uh, next on the agenda, number four, uh, organizational updates, 4A, revisit regular meetings, date, and time for any changes. Um, and this is kind of my thing. Uh, I would, if everybody's okay with it. Uh, hey, kinda, Tom? Yeah, go ahead. We actually have to do the public invited to be heard. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> number three. <laughs> Thanks for that, Laura. No uh, problem. Erica, was there anybody from the public that wanted to be heard? don't have anybody now. All right. So now we're going to 4A. <laughs> uh, I am proposing, if everybody's okay with it, uh, a 9 a.m. meeting rather than an 8 a.m. Does anybody have any conflicts with that? No? Okay. I'm good. All right. Perfect. Okay. So I Is moved... it going to stay the same Tuesday of every month, just at yeah, 9 a.m. I, I just wanted to make it as easy as possible. Like I can, I can get my son to the bus basically, and then make the meeting at nine o'clock, no problem. So if we just push it back an hour, uh, that'll give me plenty of time for that. Uh, so I move we change our meeting um, for the LHA advisory board to 9 a.m. Same uh, Tuesday as currently. Stated. I'll second. Okay. We got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion needed? Seeing none, uh, if <clears throat> approval of the <clears throat> motion, please raise your hand. Uh, passes unanimously. Um, so next one, 4B, proposed changes to process for interviewing LHA advisory board members. Tom, I'll go ahead and take that one if, if that's all right. Yep. 
so the, this evening on the council agenda is uh, staff has based on uh, actually a uh, council request is recommending a change in the process for how council selects um, advisory board uh, participants. And, and, uh, and in essence, what is, uh, you know, what is being recommended and, um, you know, the, the full document is, is uh, on the website for tonight's council meeting. If, uh, if you wanna review that and actually I can send a link to that um, after the meeting is, is, is basically to have more current advisory board member participation in that process. So in, in essence, and, and there's probably more detail than this, but in essence, the, um, what is being uh, suggested that council consider is that there would be um, kind of a, a, a screening interview process by the, the current uh, board members for applicants who apply for, so in this, in this case would be for the Lama Housing Authority Advisory Board. And, um, and the recommendation would be there would be um, no more than two representatives from the board for um, basically for open meeting purposes to, um, to, to work with the advisory board liaison to do uh, basically pre-interviews of the applicants who apply for the advisory board. And, and then at that point in time, the advisory board would make recommendations to city council about um, which applicants to, um, you know, to you know, select or that, that pass that first level of, of screening, if you will. And then my understanding is that at that point in time, city council would, um, would only uh, interview those board members that are applicants that are recommended by the um, by the advisory board, they could certainly interview more. They could interview less, you know, whatever. So, but but they would they would consider the recommendations from the um, sitting advisory board in determining how they're going to move forward with um, further interviews for those um, for those candidates. What I just uh, sent you early this morning because I didn't put it in the packet. Um, was uh, was the list of current questions that the the council members um, ask of applicants of for the Lama Housing Authority Advisory Board? Uh, these questions were, I think, developed by the board and, and by some of the staff liaisons, and um, and so we would have the opportunity if there are different questions that you would want to ask. You know, you certainly can can do that. But what is being recommended is whatever we ask are those questions are consistent with each applicant. Um, and, and so for right now, you know, the questions really have to do with, you, you know, what do you know about affordable housing? Um, what, what people, uh, what applicants think about the key roles of a board member serving on the Lamont Housing Authority Advisory Board? Um, and the kind of the purpose of the Lama Housing Authority, the greatest strengths and skills that the candidates would bring to the advisory board, and, um, and just some ideas about what they think some of the challenges might be today and moving forward with the, um, with the uh, advisory board. And, and then ending with, what's the greatest hope that you have for the, the work and for the future of the, the Lamont Housing Authority? So those are the ex existing questions right now. Um, it, it looks like we do need to modify these because I think these were developed when uh, council was interviewing applicants for the, um, for the governing board, which is a little bit different. So, so we'll have opportunity to come back um, and maybe at our next meeting and, and um, update and refresh those questions that you would want to um, that you want to ask based on if indeed council provides that direction tonight to city staff about going forward in this direction. They might say, heck no, we don't want to do this. <laughs> so um, so what we wanted to do is just to give you a heads up that this is in the hopper and this will be discussed tonight at the council meeting and if indeed we get the direction to move forward in this fashion, 
then um, then we will bring back some further conversation about questions and and how you would want to organize the process based on the direction that we get. Harold, did I miss anything or? No, other than we'll we'll know more to tonight. We just wanted to let you all know this was coming. Um, if they go with our suggestion for mid-year recruitments, um, the board interviews will be the month of May at some point based on the schedule the clerks put together. Uh, but all of this is subject to change based on what they direct tonight. So. Okay. Thank you for the heads up. And is this a kind of a hope just so that it kind of whittles down some of the applicants as well? So the city council doesn't have to review as many? Is that the hope? Um, I think you, it's you partially. Okay. Yeah. So it's partially that. I think it's partially uh, they want a more in depth um, sort of recommendation from the boards and the staff that are going to be working with individuals to ensure that people really understand what the work is that are that they're going to be undertaking. And and so I just think they want to bring more due diligence into this process to um, and for prospective applicants to hear, well, here's how much work, work goes into it or here, here's who you're going to contact. So I think all of that's there's some best hopes all over this. That sounds like a good idea. Any other comments? All right. Uh, let's go on to uh, 4C, um, overview collaboration between LHA and public safety. So I will also introduce this, Tom, if that's all right. The, um, you, you know Lisa, um, who had a birthday yesterday, if you could tell, on Valentine's <laughs> Day. <laughs> so <laughs> she has a very festive office. And, uh, and then, um, so this will be a, a, a discussion and presentation by uh, Lisa and by Sarah Arney, who is uh, works with public safety. She's one of our master police officers. He, her background isn't as festive <laughs> today, but, um, but we thought we wanted to do is just to update the advisory board on, um, on our the housing authority and the partnership with um, with uh, public safety and how that really has evolved over the past couple of years and um, and and just for them to provide some um, just some updates and opportunity for the advisory board to ask any questions about about what we're up to. So it's been a really invaluable. Um, relationship and collaboration between LHA and the and public safety and we wanted to just um, share a little bit of information about that so I would say take it away Sarah and Lisa all right Lisa do you want me to start go for it great well thanks for uh, inviting me today I wanted to start off with uh, hi Jean it's been some time since I've seen you um, Good to, good to see you, but not, uh, not really on the computer. Um, <laughs> um, wanted to give you all a, a background on the crime-free housing program. That's what really um, enabled this relationship. And this May, it'll be 12 years that crime-free housing program's been in Longmont. That's, a, that's incredible, in my opinion, um, in, the, in the strides we've made and the things we've done. But really, this, is, uh, this program is based upon relationships in the housing industry itself. And um, it's a very vast uh, industry, as you all know, uh, I'd assume. So um, how, how we collaborate with LHA really is through several, several avenues, uh, whether that be property safety, um, you know, residents that might have some behavioral issues, community meetings, ensuring um, the folks that live, are living in these properties have the information they need regarding any public safety issue um, and, and really working with Lisa as a regional manager um, intricately with every property regarding all these um, different, different things that come up. Um, I can get into more specifics, but I, I would like uh, Lisa to be able to chat about what her thoughts are and um, I can give you guys some examples of how, how we've made some positive impacts I would say, um, first, our relationship with the police department has gotten so much better from what I've heard. 
having the police presence on site, Sarah visiting these sites, walking the sites, interacting with the residents, being part of these coffees and conversations we had, and um, having that positive relationship with the residents has really gone far the last year. Sarah has been a great asset along with Dave and the Crime Free Program as they've been able to assist us with evictions, um, helping us navigate how to keep these people off our properties once we're evic they're evicted, working through welfare checks, working through different agencies, even within the public safety department. Um, I'm trying, I just drew a blank on all this. Um, but it's been a great relationship. It's come far. All of our properties have now been inspected for the crime free. So we're, we're moving that way. All of them should be completely SEPTED certified. Um, probably here by the end of spring, we just have a few minor things to do at a couple of the communities that we are working on. Lisa, can I um, butt in and maybe explain that piece a little bit better? Yeah. So um, when she says SEPTED, uh, that, that's an acronym that stands for Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. And that is, um, it's actually a cert certification that Dave and I have that we have to keep up. And um, it's not, it's really not rocket science, but what, what it comes down to is um, having the education and base knowledge of, of security of property. Um, we've, we've done assessments on schools, uh, we've done assessments on churches, so it really doesn't, um, if it's a built structure, we can, we can basically do or conduct a SEPTED inspection, we call it. So all, all of the crime-free properties in our program, which are about 230, um, have been inspected. Um, you know, our, our relationship with the manager is to ensure that those, those things that we look at, like lighting, landscaping, a few things on the internal side, like what kind of window locks you might have uh, on the on the new builds. All, all these things are really just built in. It's the old properties that they have to go back and and um, and basically, you know, change out a few things like the 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 locks or maybe it's time to upgrade and get new windows. Um, so really basic stuff like that. And so um, all of all of the LHA properties have been inspected. And I also sit on the DRC for the city and review the plans prior to. Sarah, you might want to say what that acronym stands for. Oh, I'm sorry. Development right. Review Committee. Um, so the, the city has staff that uh, a Development Review Committee that reviews all um, planning for new builds. And I don't, that's a full time job if I were to do that um, full time. But I do all the multifamily properties that are coming in, which are quite a few. So it's really nice to meet these folks ahead of time, be able to give them some of a public safety perspective and some suggestions on, um, you know, what what are we seeing as far as current current trends and issues on properties? Um, we aren't fire code, which that means a builder doesn't have to do anything that we ask. But um, our our city staff has really um, embrace this, you know, what we're doing and what we're trying to do. So um, they've, they've actually helped out tremendously um, planning and development, help our, our program tremendously as far as, you know, making this a very high, a high, you know, priority, so to speak, as far as when they start to build. So I just wanted to touch on that real quick. So when the, the new building next to the suites gets built, same with Chrisman, um, I, I'm a part of that. And that's, I think, I think for, um, as a you know, police officer, city staff member, I, I really um, embrace those opportunities personally because I, I feel like I've got um, you know, a, a seat at the table, so to speak. Okay, Sarah? Um, uh, and Lisa both, um, are the managers still attending uh, the crime-free training that we used to have every other year? Okay, that's still going on, okay. Jean, and I didn't break down um, requirements, but uh, real quick, every this is a free program to anyone that wants to join. 
uh, it's it's not mandatory. Some cities and municipalities make this they make this program mandatory, and it does change mm -hmm. rental properties across municipalities citywide. Right. Longmont hasn't pushed for that. Um, needless to say, we have a lot of folks that are in our program, and they have to come to an eight-hour training, and that's a long day for folks, but super valuable. Jean could probably mm -hmm. attest to that yeah. as it well. Yes, so everyone on the LHA staff has been to our training, except Adam, because he's new. Yes, okay. <laughs> oh, also, uh, Sarah, what about, um, uh, are you still doing landlord tenant, um, the meetings once a month? We, okay. we, are, we are, that's now going on 12 years as well. So okay. we're doing that the second Wednesday of every month at 6.30, and that's still online. Okay. All right, thank you. So part of it too, just so you know, <clears throat> Friday meetings, Sarah's giving her report in combination with Lisa, they're talking about what they're doing. So every Friday we're getting briefed on what's going on at all the properties. And it lets us kind of dig in a little bit on issues. And, and sometimes there may be issues that are not necessarily police related, but touch police and code enforcement. And so then Sarah's facilitating the conversation with other groups as we're moving through. And so completely different um, operational profile now versus uh, what happened, but it, it's um, basically highlighted with Lisa and Sarah constantly communicating with each other and staying on the same page. And so really more of our Fridays have now shifted to, here's what we're dealing with and here's what we've come up with to solve the issues. And then we ask a couple of questions versus you know, truly digging into it, or it may be another issue we're aware about that we dig into, but then we push to them. And so um, the communications have been phenomenal in terms of how we deal with situations. And, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the program itself, um, property managers and LHA specifically get any calls for service that may happen on property, they'll get that the next day. So um, if, if I'm at work, which Monday through Friday, pretty much I'm paying attention what's going on with the radio. Um, if it's like a fire or something like that, um, I'm calling right away. Um, but as far as like just a noise disturbance or um, maybe a trespassing issue, um, those are, are notifications that folks get every every day. So that's that's I think valuable to Lisa and the LHA managers. And then we can we just touch base and follow up on next next steps. Get back off that because we're getting the calls for service daily. So I'm keeping kind of a list of who's even for situations at like the suites, Aspen Meadows neighborhood, other properties, if we start seeing the same household come up multiple times, then Sarah and I are having deeper conversations. Do we need to get core involved? Do we need to refer to adult protective services depending on the situation? And we're walking through these situations, trying to avoid bigger situations and kind of being proactive on these. And I think a lot of this has shown in our calls for service I think when I started, the suites was having 20 plus a week. Now, most of them are just welfare checks, maybe two or three a week. Yeah, the calls, I would say, have gone down tremendously. So I, I've been working with LHA prior to the city taking over. Um, I can tell you the relationship. Um, obviously, I've wor you know, worked with some of the city staff um, for a long time, but I just think that where LHA is now, I mean, this is kind of an outside perspective, where it is now versus where we were, I think um, I, I'm, I'm being utilized to the extent that I knew that LHA had, had the capacity to, to use, if that makes sense. Um, I think there's more to um, properties and people living in, in rental properties than just, oh, well, the police were called here. Um, I, I think that, you know, what, what we also carry too with us is a, a very vast knowledge in, in landlord tenant law. And for police, uh, police don't study civil law. Um, I've really had to wrap uh, my brain around civil law and 
it's ever so changing, especially with the state and a lot of the things that they've done in the last two years. So keeping up on that, whereas, you know, if you're going to call patrol and ask for a welfare check or something that, that may seem like it's a little bit out of the ordinary, um, Dave and I can come in and really assess that to the extent of what, what's legal, what can we do? And I think that that's very important as property managers to understand that. And I think that's where they also gain uh, value in, in utilizing and being a part of this program. So uh, Lisa, with you mentioned CORE was a program that you would refer them to. What is, what is that exactly? I thought. I'll let um, Sarah take that. Uh, so <laughs> CORE is our, and that's an acronym. And I, I butcher it all the time. Um, basically it's a, it's, we have two teams in, in public safety and it consists of a law enforcement officer, a paramedic and a mental health clinician. And those folks respond to right here, right now crisis for folks on, in Longmont. Um, whether they're, you know, having a mental health problem, whether, I mean, they respond to things outside of the box too. Maybe there's a kid in school that has, has really caused some problems and it's escalated to um, the, you know, the awareness of the school resource officers, for example, they'll a lot of times call CORE. Um, CORE is used often and they respond to properties often. And they're, we're building a third team and I know our chief wants to move to a fourth team eventually. Um, so we have 24 seven coverage right now. We don't have that, but, um, is that, is that pretty much the, the gist of it? So then, uh, and do they respond then to the welfare checks as well than to the units? Is that who typically does it or is it? It depends if that's, that's a situation like if we have, if we have knowledge that there's mental health, uh, history, you know, if, do we have knowledge, um, it really is situational dependent, but they oftentimes will respond on welfare checks. And then in terms of this, the certification, is it on an annual basis this has to be done or is it you, you're good for five years? How, how does that work? What certification are you talking about? I thought about? you were saying this was a certification for the-, the, the crime, For the crime-free. Unit. Oh, the crime-free, yeah. Mm -hmm. They are, as being in the crime-free program, um, you know, yeah, they have to, the property managers have to attend a, the eight hour and then every other year they have to come to a four hour. Mm -hmm. And that's re really about legal updates and trends in Longmont and working with police. That's the last four hours of our training. And then as far as um, the properties themselves and the residents, we require a community meeting every other year. I have some, um, some folks that like to have them every year. So it really, we leave that up to, to management, but we, we have to do it every other year. You know, property, properties are very, you know, rentals are very transitory. Um, I know a lot of LHA uh, properties, we have some long-term residents there. So um, that's fantastic. But most of the time we, you know, we experience the fact that people move out. We want to get in there. We want to have a relationship built with them, build that trust. And they see our face. They have a contact if there's a problem and they can move forward knowing that they, they're confident in the fact that, man, management's working with these folks. Um, I, I, and Jean might be able to speak to that a little more because she's experienced both sides of that, of that coin, but that's, that's really the basis of it. So, so Tom, I think the one thing that I would add is that, um, you know, one of the things that we really have been trying to focus on is um, the successful tenancy of, you know, of all of our residents, because it is certainly, um, it, it's good for our residents, it's good for the, the, the housing authority, and, and so, you know, so I think through our enhanced partnerships with public safety and other um, collaborators that we really are looking at how do we, um, um, how do we notice things first? How do we notice things early? And oftentimes they are behavioral, on kind of behavioral health issues. So how do we, um, 
how do we get things on our radar quicker and are in a position to, you know, respond in a way that we can intervene and maybe pre, um, have help people be successful in their housing or prevent um, things from escalating. And, and also I think our, our consultation with public safety is around, I mean, at some point in time, you know, we, we have, uh, we have, we've, we've gone, you know, we do have to, um, you know, terminate, uh, you know, someone's uh, lease, if again, if things have gone, gone, you know, too far. So, so it's really a, a, a good um, consultation relationship. We try to bring um, the skills and expertise of, uh, of property management and um, behavioral health, you know, together to really try to help folks be successful in their tenancy. Um, and I think the other thing that public safety helps us do is to um, you know, navigate. So if we need, so who do we need to bring forward to address this particular thing or to make an improvement that we want to make? Um, you, you know, Sarah, and then she's mentioned David, that's David Kennedy, who's also in the, um, you know, an officer with our crime-free uh, program that, you know, they can also help us with, with that um, navigation. So, so I don't know if there's any other questions or if Sarah and or Lisa want to, um, if there's um, a particular um, success or story that you want to share that illustrates um, how this, how we work well together or not, don't have to, <laughs> just, just. Uh, just yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Karen, I'll pick up on that. And um uh, one of the things that uh, I experienced when I was managing was that um, most, the majority, vast majority of residents were comforted by the fact that we had a relationship with Sarah and there were um, a couple of other police officers that the residents got to know by name. And it was, um, it really increased the comfort level knowing that uh, the police are approachable uh, and uh, quote unquote on our side, <laughs> as opposed to um, big brother is ism. Um, and there were a couple of times, probably more than two, you might remember Sarah, where um, our video cameras um, actually helped in um, solving issues, let's put it that way. <laughs> Okay, but um, the partnership is strong and I'm glad to see it developing again. I've been a little concerned over the past three years because um, management's been so um, uh, patchwork. And I'm glad to see this developing and, and coming on board because it, it really is um, a very important arm of um, maintaining a, a good, stable, and safe resident environment. I can just bring, it's not really an example, but one thing I can say, LHA, um, when I was talking earlier about how they could utilize us more, I see, like Karen was talking about this collaboration and really consultation piece. Um, you know, I always try and it, and this is, you know, work, work, um, smarter, not harder. And I see that a lot in the folks that I work with in law enforcement, it seems like they, it, it's all about, you know, let me just run this myself versus let's getting everyone at the table. And so I've seen LHA really utilize me a lot more in, um, in, in every situation really. And I think that's just invaluable, um, whether it be me or someone else, just the knowledge that um, we can pass on and some of the experiences that we've seen in, in properties in the last 12 years is, um, I, I think it's just gonna help LHA grow to what I see becoming, uh, I, I would say, um, I don't wanna you know, put every, the, heart, the, the car before the horse, but, I see so much opportunity for LHA and the residents here in Longmont, much more than I did before, so. 
Yeah, it's great to see that, yeah, you and Lisa have a have a great relationship. And, you know, like what Lisa said earlier, kind of the, the proof is behind the, the, the number of sweets calls that we were getting in the past compared to now and being more proactive than reactive to some of those situations. And like Jean said, it's it's really, you know, public safety is uh, for our residents is, is one of our uh, core uh, goals as well. So uh, any other comments? anybody yeah. all right let's go on then to uh, number five development and project updates assignment with uh, alignment with goals uh, a is a uh, proposed ARPA investments Karen or Harold so I'll, I'll start this so and then Harold can finish it <laughs> so so uh, uh, what I did include in your, what we did include in your, <clears throat> excuse me, in your, your packet is the, um, the recommendations that Harold brought to the Lamont City Council in, in January of this year with how to, um, how to spend the city's uh, 12.9, almost $13 million in, um, in, in ARPA funding. And as well as then what, what amount of dollars would the city leverage from its other resources to bring forward some of these goals. So um, I think what we wanted to do is we don't have to go over into um, in detail necessarily unless you have questions for Harold, but we wanted to, um, to, to just bring that forward many of those, uh, particularly the development projects. Uh, so a, a, a huge investment in, in the city's ARPA funding, um, nearly $8 million of the $13 million is, is to address the city's and certainly the Lama Housing Authority's affordable housing goals. And so, so I think we, and we got the go ahead, you know, from city council to move forward. And so, just thought it might be good to uh, confirm, um, you know, where we're headed. And um, so then take it away, Harold and Molly. Yeah. <laughs> so. so the, um, you can see on the list, the different types of projects, um, a couple of things um, you see next slide uh, bulk agreements. It's something we've been working on to get internet access for everyone, obviously not construction. Um, but what we're going to do is we'll seed money this for three three years, and then we can gradually build it into the rent structure so we can have these uh, bulk agreements in place for next slide. Um, I'm going to take you uh, to the first two projects on the affordable housing side, Sunset Heights. Christman Development Sunset Heights is the project adjacent to the suites. Um, we are in um, for the tax credit component um, with DOH. Um, in Chaffa, we're in that process now. Um, Molly, we should know by what day? Uh, we're th it should be April-ish, but yeah, we, so. the application went in February 1st for 9% tax credits. So that's a 9% competitive tax credit program. Um, so we put 1.3 in. In the event that we don't get the 9%, it gives us some options to essentially recreate that structure uh, via uh, investment in the financial model. Um, we also put 800,000 into Christman development. Um, the numbers tend to be moving all over the place based on construction costs. Um, and so we are back in front of DOH asking for some additional assistance. Um, hopefully we will hear something in, in the near future, but we are finalizing the LOI. We actually were in meetings yesterday. That'll be finalized tomorrow. Um, so our goal is really probably by the end of the year to have those two projects under construction. Um, and um, they're a little bit different. Um, I would say Sunset Heights is probably a more traditional look at it. Christman, there's, um, it's less traditional in terms of how we're structuring the agreement so that we can take over uh, management responsibilities and some other things. And so hopefully those two are going to continue moving. I was trying to explain to someone else, they go, well, it takes so long, what's going on? Um, it's kind of this back and forth thing when you're moving in the development cycle in the development world um, in terms of, you know, you come in, you put your plan together, you understand what your capital stack's gonna look like. 
you start building it, they change a the tax credit component on you a little bit. So you have to back up, kind of figure that out or pricing changes on you as you're moving forward. So then you have to back up and figure that gap. And so when you're really moving in this development stage, it's a lot of this as you're trying to resolve these issues, but you continue to move forward. A um, couple of things in here, we did uh, put 1.7 million in seed money to try to find a partner for an affordable assisted living component and, and then 1.5 million for an unhoused option of which we don't know what it is. We just know that we need it. Um, so if you look at this year and you see Sunset Heights, Christman, you also see the resyndication of Village Place. Three pretty big projects coming forward. Um, once we get uh, the first two done, we're really gonna be looking at the development of the Hover property, which is adjacent to the lodge in Hearthstone. Um, and that'll be hopefully working with some of these manufactured housing groups um, to get that work, to get that done. So Indy Dwell is the one that I know Molly and I visited, we're pretty interested in. It's kind of hard to get that one started because um, we need to get these first two done. Uh, and then you, you can obviously see the Project Mustang. Uh, we, we purchased the nine acres for affordable housing. Um, we will begin conversations on the housing component once we actually get uh, the Costco piece closed and everything, which should be in a couple of weeks. And then the, the owner of the property is um, the remaining parcels wanting to talk to us about um, how we're going to look at our nine acres for affordable housing, but how he's also interested in attainable housing. So that's going to be pretty large project, but we're going to be working collectively on that with, um, with Reggie Golden. So you can see a lot of projects starting to, to really pick up steam. Um, draw your attention to the bottom staff development finance. Um, that's staff and that, that's positions that we need um, because obviously we would like to, to, move, to move more quick, more quickly, but or quicker, but we just don't have the bodies right now. I mean, we're, we're just in a body deficit. And so we can do what we can do. So we put about a half a million dollars in here for um, a staff development and finance position or positions, depending on how we structure. And then that's something that between the housing authority and the um, general fund, we'll look at how we put, how we uh, basically fund those per positions in perpetuity via general fund and housing authority dollars and, and partnering on that. So a lot of work coming. Um, the thing you can also see is purchasing mobile home the Royal Mobile Home Park, which was adjacent to the St. Vrain and part of our uh, flood recovery, um, we did get the money in there to, um, to do that for $3 million. So we're also acquiring a lot of property as we continue to move forward as well uh, to get these projects going. I'll just add on that we do have the, we have a development like a development specialist position has been posted. So we're ap accepting applications. So if you know anybody, share it. Um, we do have an, a, a half-time accountant on board specifically to handle ARPA. So we've made a little bit of progress, but we need a good applicant to come in to help with the development and really speed up that process. I had a question on the Chrisman side of it. Is that also included in there? We would take over management of their other facility as well? Yeah, so, and, and that's part of what we're having to work through. We spent some time yesterday uh, with some attorneys in terms of where we say it's still a moving target because I think we had it earlier in there, but the investor um, essentially said, <clears throat> We had it pretty close to stabilization in our initial agreement and the investor said, no, nope, um, you need to stabilize and then go out in time. And I think they said, what, five years? And then we're gonna push back with three years. And two, Christman one, we're trying to hold to take it over at the original date, which would be in a couple of years um, in terms of the management piece. And so those are the things we're still working through based on what the investor said in terms of Christman two, but yes. And then just those, the staff development finance, those are brand new positions that we don't have budgeted for, correct? Well, they're budgeted with the ARPA money 
And so there will be new positions that we haven't had money for that we do yeah. now, but that we will then incrementally start bringing in ongoing dollars so that we can keep those positions in perpetuity. It, but And they will be established right now as fixed term positions. Right. Um, given that ARPA funds are one-time investments. And as Harold mentioned, that gives us the opportunity to build in um, ongoing funding for for um, for that position, unless we decide we don't need it, but we're not thinking that's gonna, <laughs> we're thinking probably that will be a need on an on ongoing basis, but for right now, yeah. they're established as fixed term. Um, and so really this year, I mean, you could see um, three major construction or rehabilitation projects going at the same time. And then once we get those going, we're going to start on the next set. And so if you remember the goal of six development projects in four, four years. Um, so at some point in this, we're probably going to have uh, probably four projects going at once, four to five at one time, just in different stages of development. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work coming. As Molly takes a deep breath. So I was gonna say, breathe, I like Molly. A... <laughs> Molly, I feel for you because, like at BCHA, we've got three projects in various stages, and then we've got three project managers, and I don't, and it's a lot of work. So I hope you guys are able to get this position filled. We're having a hard time getting positions filled too. It's across the board, but yeah, I feel I feel for you. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. we may have to pull some of our project managers that we use generally from the city. Um, but yeah, so no, we've got one, two, three, four. We've actually got five going right now at different stages. Um, yeah, fun. Well, luckily in the the way that we've set up the partnerships in some of them, in some of them is that, um, really we're we're heavily heavily in right now on the financing negotiation but then they are going to do the heavy lift when it comes to design and construction so mm -hmm. so it's not it's not as much as doing the full full project management but it's still um it's still a lot so yeah the financial part's hard the construction and design is the fun part yeah <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully you get to help out on the fun stuff too eventually well village um, place you, does offer the opportunity yeah. for that so yeah. do you know if um if any of these projects are going to apply for worthy cause funds from the county for soft uh, cost not well no probably not we don't like the terms um honestly okay. the, the the county has in terms of 99 what is it a Karen, I think it's like a 99 year term. Yeah. Yeah. From a, it just, um, that's sort of our last resort if we need to make a capital stack work. And so to give you a sense on, um, on, it was Christmas actually, that was something they threw out. And um, when we have the ARPA dollars, it's like, yeah, no, we're not going to do that because we're going to want maximum flexibility in terms of what we need to do. And so, um, it's there, but it's typically our last choice. Is that a fair statement, Karen? This is very exciting to see. So it's all gonna be happening within the next couple of years. Um, any other comments on that? We can go on to uh, Village Place Resyndication. I can go ahead and take this one. Um, so the current status is we have our property conditions assessment report in. Um, it looks like the, the, the capital needs are in the range of 5.4 million, which actually the building itself is in quite good shape for its age. Um, and then the, the parking lot does need a lot of work. So the next steps here are um, to... Amp, ramp up our finance, come, start coming up with budgets and work on getting our architect on board. So if you recall from um, what we reported after 
the kickoff meeting with residents in early January is the next big residential input opportunity that we're going to do is as we have that architect on board and we're getting started on design and and in coming up with our our wish list and our needs list. Um, so that is the status there. Generally, the yeah the building is that you know the brick is in good shape. Overall, it's not a huge, huge project on the building other than um, doing some reconfigurations to make it more useful for residents, but not necessarily structural problems and kind of the big ticket items aren't, aren't is, as in dire need. That doesn't mean that they're not gonna be part of the project because we're looking for the 20 year horizon. So, um, but generally that's what our capital needs assessments showing. So we're um, really gonna push forward on financing now is the next step. And are, are we gonna carve out the piece that is the, uh, that we lease out the, uh, to, can't remember the nonprofit name, but the, I think it's disability services over there. So that is part of our financing discussions that we need to have because we need to talk to Chaffa about the possibility of splitting that off because that's, that's what the goal is to try and split that off and be able to separate the two, at least when it comes to the Chaffa tax credits. And then I want to, there's, I want to let anybody else ask questions on the process, but I do want to turn it over to Lisa to give an update on um, a parking discussion that she had with residents yesterday. yesterday. But if there's any other questions on the resyndication process where we are, I'd be happy to take those. So yesterday I had my first meeting, which I'll touch base on a little bit more in the property update because we're bringing on a tow company slash parking lot monitoring company, which is going to really play heavily for Village Place. Because for years they've had issues with people visiting downtown parking in their spots and all that. Every resident currently had, well, those who have vehicles have assigned parking spots. So we started the discussion yesterday, letting them know that these parking spots the assignment of their parking spots are gonna slowly disappear over the next six months as we start bringing the contractors in, um, as we start working with architects, um, contractors, so that they are aware that they won't have that permanent parking spot forever. <coughs> we, we planted the seed. Big, we planted that seed yesterday because that has been their biggest concern because they some of them have had assigned parking spots for 12 years. And they're like, well, I'm losing my parking spot. We're like, you are, but you're not. You're still going to be able to park back there. It's permit parking only. So if you don't have, if somebody parks back there who doesn't have a permit, their car will be gone. <laughs> so. so overall, Lisa, how did it, how did the residents respond? Very well. I was actually really surprised <laughs> because they are my most vocal bunch when it comes to, um, standing up for their community and their pride in their community. Um, but most of them, I'd say 95% of them who attended, which was probably about 40 residents were, okay, we understand. Yes, we need more handicap. We know we need to work on this parking lot. If this is gonna make it better for everybody then I'm in. So, and we've come up with some solutions. We're working with um, LDDA to possibly make a motorcycle parking lot or a parking space out front in the U shape between the spoke and us, we have a little weird parking spot. So LDVA is open to our discussion to make motorcycle parking. So I have two residents with motorcycles who would like to park up front and can share a space in. <coughs> Sorry. So I think um, it, it's feeding into our re-syndication <coughs> process because we, um, the, first of all, this is the only property with assigned parking. And so, and generally we cannot be, I mean, assigning handicap spaces without a reasonable accommodation process is not um, not the correct process. So uh, we're just really going to get the, eventually when after the construction, we want the property to be operating similar to the others when it comes to parking. Um, and of course, reconfiguring the parking to add more. We just, it's all, all cycled together, including LDDA, um, who did confirm for us that the parking spaces that um, are a part of the construction zone for the spoke are going to be reopening in April. Did she say, Lisa? April? Um, End of March, early April okay. when they get CFO. 
And we did get some feedback from yesterday that um, we do, we might have some residents that are interested in um, covered parking at the spoke. So, or in, in the parking garage associated with it. So we're going to, at first we were the feedback that we originally got that was like, maybe not. Um, but we're going to be including that in part of our resident surveys anyways, but we're going to be using all of this information to come up with, um, you know, our plan for, for how to address the parking at Village Place as part of the project. And to be, um, so this area, part of what we're gonna look at is also the drainage. And so we know that there's some drainage issues coming in that creates um, ice issues in the winter. But to be clear, this is also going to be corresponding with the Kaufman Street project that we're gonna be under, going under construction on from basically, um, what is it, Long's Peak to First and, and, and the Kaufman project. So there's going to be a lot of construction uh, in this area over the next two, probably two to three years. All right, any, I don't see any questions. So let's go on to uh, item number six, items for input to LHA Board of Commissioners. A is property tax exemption policy. Oh, I will take this one as well. So um, on February 24th, we're planning to take the property tax exemption policy to the Board of Commissioners. Basically, um, the it's it's been common practice for housing authorities to extend property tax exemptions to partnerships that they work on with um, in developing affordable housing. But the the point of this and is becoming more um, more solid or more common practice is to really leverage that to benefit affordable housing more overall. So what this property tax exemption policy essentially does is develop a calculation for what the, um, the fee should be to participate in the tax exemption based on the number of, of, of highly affordable units, if there's um, support permanent supportive housing involved, basically having a, a scale to, to provide those benefits to affordable housing developers. So um, the scale, the calculation is shown in here. Um, I will just, just to ground the discussion, the, the, the two projects that we have going forward, uh, the Sunset Heights project and Chrisman will, will be, um, they will re receive a tax exemption as part of their projects. And so they will fall into this calculation formula and specifically Sunset Heights is permanent supportive housing. Um, and they are, uh, LHA is partnering in both projects. So then the application fees, we can consider waiving those. So um, that's just kind of how the first two upcoming projects could, could be a, have their um, tax exemption applied in this case. So is there any questions on this? Is there any um, feedback on it? Go ahead, Lauren. I think you're on mute, Lauren. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. When my headset dies, then it all gets wonky. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Are we only looking at enacting like an a fee to replace the lost um, revenue, or are we looking at other development terms like, um, you know, a right of first refusal or a right to purchase or to take over management, something that would get us in the door in an ownership capacity down the line? Um, so I think this is for, this is for development partners that LHA is working with. So that's kind of earlier in the process. So at that point, um, those aspects might be negotiated separately. I think this is really just, this is an incentive for affordable housing developers, obviously. And this is just trying to incent more affordable units or more highly affordable units. Mm -hmm. So I, at this point, it's definitely not part of the right of first, first refusal or other 
aspects such as that are not included in this property tax exemption policy. Um, is there is that a is that something that you've seen in the past, or are we thinking creatively about how this could? I just know BCHA has has partnered with um, private developers before to lend their tax exemption, and as part of the terms. Um, you know, we might have a right of first refusal or a right to purchase later down the line so that we can um, take over either in, or step into the investor investor right. shoes um, or take over property management, um, just ways to uh, make sure that the affordability stays in perpetuity because some of these can come out of affordability down the line. And um, one of our goals is to make sure that doesn't happen. And right. so one tool is for us to eventually take it over. Um, so that if the people who build it, the private developers, if they want to get out, right. they have an option to do so. Um, and then we have a way to keep it affordable. I'm happy to talk to you more about that later. Yeah. So I'm <laughs> thinking that this policy is for, it's when LHA is extending the tax exemption policy. So it is not explicitly in here in that form, but that assumes that we are partnering in some way. And then we do, we have that opportunity to do that, and but let's, let's chat about that. Okay. Karen or Harold, do you have any questions or input on that? Yeah, no, I, was, I was kind of thinking through this because, you know, we're, we're slightly different in that we have the development side, but then we have what we're doing from the affordability side as the city in terms of the 12% requirements, investments that we make. And so there's a piece in there that we might need to think about is um, depending on what it is, you know, we have the third of 30 year affordability clauses and things like that. We might want to see how we, we bring in the first right of refusal, but yeah, we do that definitely from an LHA standpoint and on the ARPA funds, we'll definitely have that as part of the agreements. Um, but yeah, let, let's talk about that a little bit, Molly. Okay. Good suggestion. Jean, you had your hand up. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, Harold just addressed my concern. So the, the value, so the, in the formula number two, it has that 7.15% update is needed. Is that like a, a set kind of percentage that is common in the sort of partnership fee or how was that calculated or determined? So I do have to re uh, refer back to our CFO's uh, <laughs> specifics on the tax calculation piece on this. So I know that the, let me look into that further. Cause I think my primarily my um, information from our CFOs on the mill levy piece that is already um, the 2021 update is coming. Let me check on that 7.15 and get you some more detail on that. Okay. I don't want to misspeak on it without referring back to the, you know. That's not, and then the other thing, so the, Partnership fee is then this paid over 15 years as well, kind of the compliance period. It's kind of unclear, or is it a one? Is this like a is it a like a lump sum amount? So, um. So I know that the it's going to be applied after the tax credits are in. Let me check on what makes most sense is that as well, because we don't specify. So I wonder, I'm wonder. i wondering if there's an opportunity to do one or the other, depending on um, kind of how, in some cases, the fee is going to be quite small, like for Sunset Heights, um, compared to if, if it's being extended to something else that has a different affordability range, it might be much larger. So let me see if there's flexibility in that. All right. <clears throat> Sorry. I thought we were trying to build flexibility and to do either or depending on the value. Um, that's what I'm remembering from that conversation. So you didn't want to lose a project if that number was too big. Right. Then negotiate payments on it over time or if it was small enough, you just took it. Okay. 
And in full disclosure, I'm, I'm inheriting from Kathy. So I do have to refer back to some of her prior discussions. So we'll get you answers though. But, and I think it's good input in terms of what we need mm -hmm. to do. Um, so this is why it's really valuable to bring these items to the advisory board before we take this to the board of, yeah. of commissioners. So, so obviously that's something that we'll want to um, consider how to incorporate in the policy. If, if indeed that flexibility or how those payments will be made. Mm -hmm. And is this, um, is this opportunity only for private developers who are doing 100% some kind of affordable or does this include developments that have a market rate piece? Well, uh, it could be either. However, LHA is the, the common thread. So it needs to be something that where LHA will be managing it eventually. It's an LHA co-development project. Um, so it's not gonna be extended to any affordable housing developer. Okay, so if Element were to come in and they were just gonna do a straight affordable housing development and they weren't partnering with us in any way, they could not apply for this? Yeah, okay. probably not. Okay. And then market rate, obviously they'll, they have the fee and lieu option if they don't wanna do the affordability. Correct. Right. Okay, so this is just another tool to try to encourage them to partner with LHA instead of going that route, okay. Yeah, yeah and, and, and leverage a position for LHA in the future, whether it's yeah. management or whatever it is. I think it's a and good to give idea. You, to kind of bring you full circle, so if we were looking at a development project similar to what we did with uh, Fall River or Spring Creek, um, we would probably, with our ARPA dollars that we're putting in, probably only get what Molly one project, maybe mm -hmm. one, um, based on our ARPA allocation. What we're actually doing is leveraging like hopefully six to seven projects with our ARPA allocation in this develop the, this development model where it's a partnership with a private development entity of which we then take ownership in the future. So what we're trying to do is maximize the value of the ARPA dollars, combine it with all of these things as we're bringing in to get more projects. Okay. And then getting to your point, how do we leverage it? And uh, we probably we need to clear that up. It's really good information coming from this conversation. Let's go on to the next item. Um, Number seven, items not part of the LHA work plan goals. This is the one that's just always on the agenda. Is that right, Karen? Yeah. Correct. So this is one of the standard items and we didn't have anything listed there. So, but if indeed the, um, if the advisory board has, has anything, we, we are just as a um, FYI is that we have, yet to take those, um, the LHA goals that you have provided input on to the Board of Commissioners for, um, for final ad adoption, but that is planned to go on uh, February 24th. So that's uh, a standard item and we didn't have anything to add. Go ahead, Lauren. I was just gonna say, um, just circling back to last month, I get to stay, yay. Oh, right. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't talk about that okay. at all. Okay. I, 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 I have to end, end, but I have oh, a note on awesome. other business. <laughs> yeah, I figured it would be there, but um, uh, inquiring uh, minds probably want to know. So yeah, I yeah, say. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was determined that uh, since we don't fall within the city charter, we're right. still part of the uh, Loma Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. Um, we, it, Lauren is able to stay even though she moved out of the city. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I do. Um, I do actually have something for other business. It's um, we're all gonna have to figure this out today and tomorrow. Um, the county, um, Boulder County Public Health. On Friday, February 18th, um, 
they're going to um, the the Ma universal masking ordinance ends on uh, the February eighteenth, Friday, February eighteenth, and so um, it's kind of interesting. In um, there's some connects, there's some pieces in here that we're going to have to look at um, where there still may be some requirements. Um, and it's unclear um, based on the federal component because they still they said like head starts and things like that still have a requirement. So um, we're going to have to be looking into this this week and figuring it out by Friday because it looks like Friday it's all um, going to be lifted. And the state order about masking for non-vaccinated persons 11 and older is still technically in effect. So. How do you enforce it is the question. Yeah, because the state was kind of pushing it to the counties too, which was creating a lot of, lot of chaos because Denver dropped it, the county started dropping it. Um, we just know that it changes on Friday. So uh, we'll, we'll be getting that communication out for our our, all of our residents and talking about what that means for us. Yeah, as well as St. Rain Valley School District is dropping their requirement as well. In line with COVID. Her uh, Harold, I've got a question about that. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, Boulder County is dropping the mask mandate. Um, and I understand um, the glitch with the federal requirement. Um, but if there is a case that that uh, a resident, if a resident becomes ill and we have a case of COVID here, I'd like to know what that procedure is gonna be without the mask mandate. Um, uh, uh, would it be the same as, you know, isolate, lock the community areas? And I think, well, I think well, it depends. I think we've um, got to see the order and see what's in place. Um, we will, we I mean that, hey, we've got to move through that. We will, we will notify you all the same way. We will say, you know, we highly, strongly recommend that folks wear a mask and so on and so forth. Um, but in terms of what we can and can't leave open and close, we're going to have to understand these health orders. Um, so can't answer some of it other than the notifications will still come as we're aware of it. Um, not that we're always aware of it because they're so far behind in processing tests. Sometimes we don't hear about it until much later. I think something like that too, Gene, the, the public health um, department from the county will reach out to that person individually. And this is assuming that they got you know a PCR test and not one of the stay at home tests either. All right, so uh, let's go on to number eight, LHA report, a update on operations. Uh, one is occupancy report. Is that you, Lisa? Yes, it is. Okay. So um, I'm excited to say we finally reached 90%, 97% occupied, uh, which is the highest it's been since I started. So we are working quicker to fill these vacants. Um, it's helped that we have more staff <laughs> to help with these. Going through some of the properties, just a quick update. Aspen Meadows neighborhood, um, both PVV units that are vacant do have people reserved on them. We're just working through the process, getting them qualified. And the one unit that's been down due to meth contamination, we expect that to be back and available on 4-1. Um, with that, we're going to make that a manager's unit. So the manager for Aspen Meadows and Aspen Senior will probably be moving into that unit to have a presence on that site because Aspen Meadows neighborhood has now our number one call for service, even though we don't get a lot of calls. Um, they just, it's the family property, a lot of kids, um, a lot more people in a smaller condensed area. So we figured having a management presence will help with those calls for service. And then it will help her be more involved in that community. <coughs> Aspen Meadows Senior is completely occupied. Briarwoods 
um, we've had the two units sitting empty for the city funded voucher program. Both those units do have people working through the system to get qualified for that. So hopefully here in the next couple of weeks, we will have both those occupied. Fall River, we have just one vacant from the eviction and we know that there's gonna be some damage in it. We're waiting for maintenance to go in and actually pull up floorboards and um, evaluate the whole complete situation for that one. The Hearthstone and the Lodge, they both have some vacants. Um, we are working through the process to open their wait list. We have um, moved through the complete wait list we had opened later last year. And so we know we need to open it again to get more applicants. The suites, we're down to three vacants. Um, MHP has their two rented now, and that will just leave the um, meth unit, which we have to, we're now looking to piece that together to get it completed, because all of our construction bids were coming in in the 100,000 plus range, which insurance won't cover all of that. So I'm working with a few others within the city, and we're going to look to piece it, do each item separately, the drywall separately, then the flooring separately, HVAC separately, to get that in completed and under budget, hopefully in the next eight weeks. Um, Spring Creek has four vacants, um, working on a couple transfers, one meth unit we're waiting for testing on, um, and we've just reopened their wait list. Along with Village Place, they have one vacant and we've reopened their wait list. Any questions on the occupancy? We're going to move into the property updates. There's quite a few this time. So <laughs> we brought on a new maintenance tech for Aspen Meadows campus. So that's Aspen Meadows Senior and Aspen Meadows Neighborhood. He was a transfer from the city. He was a janitor with the city, um, has a lot of maintenance experience and residents are enjoying him and he's working out great. He's actually been covering four properties. Um, one of our maintenance techs fell at home on the ice and broke his arm in multiple spots. So he will be out for six to eight weeks. So <laughs> we are down a man. But um, Alvin, who we hired, is helping out and covering the four properties. Um, Molly, did you want to? Oh, sorry. So successful housing voucher waitlist. So we did open the um, Section 8 waitlist about three weeks ago, January 26th. Um, we received over 1,100 people who applied that day in person and via email for 150 spots. That was actually um, an amazing day. It went a lot smoother than we planned. We had multiple volunteers um, and repurposed people from other departments. The senior center came over and really helped me out because LHA was down due to COVID. <laughs> Um, we had a lot of people out with being ill, COVID, sick. Um, so Senior Center helped, stepped up, helped us out, and it was a successful day. The I towing have a question company. on that one, oh, actually, yeah. Lisa. So if somebody was on the wait list previously for the housing choice voucher, are they, did they, does it get rolled over to this one as well? Or you, this is like, once we open the wait list, everybody, yes. okay, all right. We had extinguished our previous wait list. Um, we did do, um, last year we had sent out letters to all those on the wait list, let them know, you know, if you were still interested in it, um, cause it kind of got stagnant. It was from 2018. So a lot of the information we had was not correct, but we did send courtesy mailings out last year, got the wait list narrowed down to a manageable amount by doing that. And then we've reached out to everybody, either qualified them, they're pending a voucher and it was time to open up and get that wait list current. Okay. And this is also lottery based, right? Correct. So that's correct, yeah, okay. And so we only took 150 names for that wait list because that is kind of what we anticipate we may be able to accommodate in a year. And then once that is exhausted, we'll open it again. So hopefully we'll be opening our wait list annually. And we did notify all those who applied this time that it will be dumped annually and then re recreated. Okay. And then as I touched on earlier, we have brought in a towing company, um, parking lot management. And this really has a lot to do um, with Village Place, Aspen Meadows neighborhood and the homestead properties. Um, we see a lot of vehicles from outside the community in these areas being parked in our parking lot. Um, 
sometimes being abandoned. Village Place gets a lot of the downtown traffic. So just taking up from the residents, being able to park in their own community. Um, we have 24 seven monitoring of these parking lots. Um, they'll do drive throughs daily, at nights, after hours, weekends, just to keep and maintain that everybody who's parking there does have a parking permit. All the residents will be getting parking permits this week and next week. We set up meetings with each of the communities to kind of go through the process. What happens, you know, if they lose their permit? What happens if they forgot to register their car? We have a lot of things that we can do to prevent a resident's car from being towed. So if a resident, say, they forgot to register their car or they registered it online and they're waiting for it to come in the mail and their tags are expired and they're scared they're going to get towed, LHA all my managers have access to the system with this monitoring company to go in and put that resident's car as a uh, do not tow. So we can mark if it's expired by, you know, two weeks that they, they're not towed because they're waiting for it. They've provided documentation. It also helps us for when we evict a resident, if that resident has been trespassed from the property, we can put their license plate in as an immediate tow if it's spotted on site because they are trespassed from the community. So we have a lot of things like that that we can do and work with the company. And um, the residents, we provided a list of all of their license plates to the company. So say the resident forgot to put their parking permit or it fell down, the company will look for it. They'll run the plate to see if it's matched to a residence, if it's in our system and give them a warning the first time. So, and then we have it also set up that, um, if they have a flat tire, they're not automatically towed. They get a warning notice. Um, if their registration's expired and we didn't put it as a do not tow because they didn't notify us or they just lost and they don't wanna say anything, they also get a warning notice for 48 hours. So there's a lot of things with this. And then the managers will get an email as well when somebody gets a warning, um, if a car is towed immediately because it parked in a fire zone, it was parked in a handicap without a handicap placard, management gets an email immediately letting them know when and why a vehicle was towed. Now, do they, do we pay a fee for this service or are they just making no. other money from the impound fees? Correct. And they do other properties here in Longmont. They're doing Roosevelt Park, um, Centennial, and a few other companies as well. Uh, Lisa, yes. um, I, I, uh, I like what I'm hearing in terms of uh, the manager and this contractor interaction um, and would I be um, in order uh, assuming that um, if a resident sees a car in the wrong place um, or a strange car or whatever and reports that to the manager, the manager can have this company follow up? Yes. Okay, we so that's, it's a two-way street. Okay. Yes, yeah, so and we'll go through right. this in the resident meetings. Like y'all, I believe yours sure. is tomorrow. I'll be there. Um, yeah. The residents Good. can even call into the if it's after hours and they see suspicious vehicle parked on site, they can call the emergency maintenance line. And Dave and I have access to have a tow nights and weekends as well. Awesome. So okay, great. Next item is um, LHA is expanding the revenue generating activities. So the city has an inclusionary housing plan um, and a lot of these market rate communities don't know how to qualify people to make sure they meet the 50%, 60% or whatever designated AMI that they're electing for that inclusionary housing. So LHA has, will be doing some of their file compliance and helping qualifying those tenants for a fee. Um, we've got on our um, first company that's reached out to us that we're gonna start qualifying tenants at um, $100 a file. Okay. So that we can, um, okay. so we'll be generating revenue off of that as well. <laughs> it's a new thing. Right. Um, Molly and I really walked through, talked with them. Kathy was part of these talks. Um, and I just think it's an, an easy way for LHA to make some money off of something all my staff is qualified to do. There you go. And yeah. it takes us a short amount of time. <laughs> okay. 
So the next one is working on a process to coordinate response when residents send multiple communications with multiple parties. Karen, I don't know if you want to touch on this a little bit. Um, this is when more of when residents reach out to board members, city council members, Harold, they're not following the pop, proper chain of command. So we have a lot of, not a lot, but a handful of residents who take the initiative to send emails, call, try to go over the property manager's head, over my head, over Harold's head, or um, other ways, trying to get their, an their items answered for very minute things. And we just, we're trying to really focus on um, pushing them back to the property manager. You need to talk to your manager. These are what the managers are here to do. Go to your manager. If your manager doesn't re solve your situation or give you, you know, what you need within a reasonable time, then come to me and then the next step. So we're really trying to educate them on those steps. I know Michelle and others have been redirecting them. Go see your property manager. You know, and what I would add to what Lisa said is that, um, so these, you know, we're customized. So we're bringing people together um, as situations arise. So, um, so there'll, there'll be some level of customization, um, you know, kind of depending on what the, what the situation is. Um, but when it gets to that point where, again, there are just multiple, could be advisory board members, could be board of commission members, it could be a variety of folks. Um, so when those kinds of things happen, um, then, then we have this team that comes together and said, okay, so how are we going to coordinate um, what comes in? And, and what that response is so that we, we do have a, a, a more coordinated response. So, um, so that we've, we've utilized that in a couple of situations. I'm sure we will continue to utilize that. But again, it's really kind of bringing in um, folks that are involved maybe with this particular resident to, to come up with what would be the, um, we wanna respond obviously to the concerns, but how to do that in a way that is um, more coordinated than, um, than scattershot like it's been in the past. So Lisa, I don't know, so I know we're about at 9.30, so I don't know if there, what else you wanna indicate on, point out in the report. And then I think we wanna turn over to Kendra for the financials. Okay, and just to piggyback off that, one of the items on the suites, we had a joint meeting with um, Senior Services, Mental Health Partners, MHP, and um, all three agencies are working together when we have these types of scenarios. And MHP has agreed to consult on certain situations, even with non-MHP um, residents, so that we can have that united, at the suites, the united agreeance of how to go about each situation. And then Spring Creek um, Senior Services um, provided some grief counseling um, or a grief meeting to, for our residents. They have had a couple of residents pass pretty quickly and suddenly all at once. So senior services did step in and um, provide some grief support. Um, we also, during one of the situations, um, public safety was a big thing. They had the chaplain come in along with victim services just to comfort the residents because it was, um, they lost a resident who was very involved in the community. And it was a sudden, so. Any questions related to the properties, the occupancy items going on? I'll see you. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Kendra, take it away. So I was hoping this month that when you got the AR receivable, it would like look like it was down, <laughs> but it doesn't because we had um, a meth unit at AMN that we ended up charging um, the meth costs for. So that did bring it up. We did do an allowance for that at 75% because, um, but one of the things we want to get geared towards is actually sending these to collections because the problem is even with us, when we bring somebody in, if we're not sending them to collections, it's not on their background. It's not on, so we have no idea that this person completely ruined a unit with meth. Um, so I know we are, Lisa and I need to get together to find a collection agency that will take this on for us. Um, and then I know this, this resident received the letter in December. So within the next, I think it's 90 days within our bad debt policy to make sure that we get them turned over to collections. 
um, and we'll work on how that process looks. Um, but most of the other properties look much better. We are going to start looking at the prepaid balances. Um, and I know that community managers are reaching out to these individuals to say, hey, your next payment, reduce it by 50 bucks because you paid, you know, overpaid in a previous period. Um, but if that doesn't work, what we may just do is issue checks to the residents so we can get the balances cleared up and then they can get that money back in their pocket. Some of this is still due to, especially with the suites, just being on the wrong ledgers. And I know Corinne is working diligently to get through all of the 70 plus residents that, <clears throat> that need their ledgers looked at. Um, does anybody have any questions on the AR side? So on Aspen Meadow, uh, Aspen Meadows neighborhood, the current is also high as well, 43,000. And the over 90 days is 39,000. Well, the current includes all. The, oh, the okay. current balance is all, and then it divides it out. Gotcha. So, so you have 30. Okay. Yeah, so the, I know. It's a little of those three. I follow you now. I thought it was current, That's, like it's owed today. It was just billed currently. Yeah, okay. no, no worries. I look yeah. at that report every time I'm like, Wait, oh wait, I gotta remember it. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we will see some anomalies in the coming months for the Hearthstone and the Lodge, um, mainly because we just received the Lodge's contract. So we just finally got paid for January and February vouchers. We still have not received the Hearthstone. Apparently HUD is still trying to find funding. So, um, they found funding for the lodge this last week. We got that taken care of, but we're still waiting on the Hearthstones contract, which expired in January. So we'll see some anomalies in the coming months that those will increase, but then once we get payment, they'll go back down. So the financials, um, this, is, this is the end of year, book the depreciation, all the interest. So it looks like a big loss, <laughs> which is, actually what the investor likes to see <laughs> on their side for tax purposes. But um, all of the properties had net income and we have a pretty good cash flow where I think almost every property is probably gonna have cash flow surplus. So we'll have cash flow payments um, this year on most all properties, whether it's paying developer fees or starting to pay certain loans down. Um, we'll look at the priority order to see, usually it's developer fees are first and then um, from there it trickles down depending on the property. Um, does anybody have any questions on the financials? Yeah, I, I want to just give a big shout out to Kendra and the team and all the property managers, because if you remember where we were two budgets ago, was it Kendra, when everything was budgeted in the negative and we were struggling to find money and to see where now every one of the properties are, I mean, or cash flowing from a cash perspective, but from a depreciation, they're in the negative, which is how the system is built. Um, the the fact that we're 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 seeing this this quickly is really a testament to the work that all of these folks have been doing. So um, yeah. and it's make the future budgets easier. So great work, Kendra and team and Lisa and everyone doing this. Great, great job. And then just uh, uh, the LHA consolidated, is that really like the administrative side, right? Um, LHA consolidated consists of Briarwood, anything that's wrapped into LHA's financials. So it's Briarwood office, the 615 Main. Um, it's all of the Prairie Village. I think Prairie Village, I, I get LHDC and LHA mixed up unless I look at them, um, right. but it's all of that consolidated into one. So it'll include the Briarwood along with the 615 and the, but I separated those out on the report so you can see exactly how those properties are doing since they're specific. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but that might not have all of the balances because we're still working on actually getting those. Um, LHDC's audit is next, which is the 20, so we have to get everything submitted by the 22nd and then LHA follows suit after that. Okay. So we're still working on going through the trial balance and making sure everything's recorded. So th those numbers will change. All right, anything else? Anything? Uh, executive director report.
Uh, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I'm having all sorts of computer issues today. Um, no, I really don't have anything other than, um, you know, what I talked about with in terms of the, the county health orders and how we're going to work through those at this point. Um, you know, I will tell you, we're making progress in hiring. We didn't announce, did, did you already announce our new addition, um, Molly, Karen? Not yet, because it's still in conditional status. Oh, okay. But we've made a conditional offer, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> to, to our ha housing choice voucher specialist. Yeah, so we're we're moving through all of these issues. It's It continues to still be an issue, but it's an issue now, both sides of the house, the city and the housing authority, but we're making progress so, slowly. But other than that, nothing really to report. They covered it all. Okay, uh, moving then on to uh, number nine. Any other business that we haven't discussed already? Go ahead, Arlene. So I have a question. I think it's probably for Harold. I'm not sure. And this is totally off the wall. That sign that's down there on the property at the railroad tracks in 21st. Now, I haven't been by there today, but yesterday it still had graffiti on it. I think that that's starting to make the whole area look trashy. Um, you know, and, it and I live east of there. And I think it reflects on all of us. So this is the second time that it's been like that. Is there a way to get them to either straight, you know, have a smaller sign, uh, put a camera on it or do something about keeping that so it doesn't trash up the area like it is? Yeah, so we have to go through code on those issues um, from a sign ordinance perspective and what, what they can and can't do. So. Um, yeah, I'm just to the east. I've actually been out of town, so I'll see it again uh, when I leave this meeting, and, and I'll get with code enforcement. But in terms of requiring things like cameras, we can't we can't make them do that, but we can definitely call code in, in our graffiti removal program um, to look into this. Uh, part of it is just so you know, we got a little behind. We had a pretty significant event a couple ago, um, and and so, but. We'll, we'll get that into them, so. Okay. Okay, we're just seven minutes over, so we'll adjourn at 9.37, and then uh, next meeting is scheduled for uh, March 15th at 9 a.m. Bye, all. Everybody. Bye. Thank you.